Dear colleagues, welcome to the today's webinar of the Working Group on Cardiovascular Regenerative and Reparative Medicine in collaboration with the ESC Scientists of Tomorrow. The title of, of this webinar is New Concepts in Cardiac Regeneration Part 1, Basic Concepts. I am Dr. Anke Smits from Leiden University Medical Center, Leiden, the Netherlands, and I have the pleasure of being joined by Dr. Nicholas Smart from the University of Oxford, United Kingdom, and Professor Diaz from the University Clinic of Navarra in Spain. The aim of this webinar is to give you a better understanding of the recent advances in cardiac regeneration and repair. In this webinar series, we aim to highlight the importance of different cardiac cell types in the process of cardiac repair. Today, we will first discuss the regulation of and cell sources of neovascularization in the formation and restoration of the heart. Second, we will present the essential role of fibroblasts in cardiac remodeling in cardiac disease. Be sure to tune in into, uh, to part two of this webinar series as well, which will be live on October 1st, where we will cover the role of the cardiomyocyte and the use of extracellular vesicles as a therapeutic strategy for the damaged heart. This session is inter interactive and we strongly encourage you to actively participate by sending your questions and comments at any time during the webinar through the chat. We will try and discuss them once both presentations are done. We also invite you to participate in online assessment sessions in the form of multiple choice questions that will be submitted during the presentations. Okay, I will now hand over to Dr. Nicola Smart for her presentation. Thank you, Dr. Schmidt. So uh, today I would like to start with a very brief overview of cardiac regeneration, just a very quick uh, recap, uh, and then focus specifically on the process of revascularization. Uh, before doing so, we would start with a multiple choice question, um, and we will come back to discuss this at the end once you've had an opportunity to submit some answers. Uh, so the question is, what are the main mechanisms that enable new blood vessel growth in the ischemic heart? And, and I suppose we should be thinking really of the adult mammalian heart in this context. So A is vascular genesis, which I'm sure you're aware is the formation of new blood vessels from vascular precursor cells. B is angiogenesis, the growth of new blood vessels from pre-existing endothelial cells. C is arteriogenesis or collateral growth, which specifically refers to the remodeling of pre-existing vessels to increase their diameter, so uh, such that capillaries can give rise to new arteries. D is a combination of B and C, and E is a combination of A, B, and C. And we'll return at the end of my presentation to discuss these possibilities. So uh, first I will start, um, as we know, the human heart is one of the least regenerative organs with cardiomyocyte renewal estimated at less than 2% per year. Uh, this increases modestly in response to myocardial infarction, but is wholly insufficient to replace the lost myocardium that occurs after myocardial infarction. Um, a similar Lack of proliferation and regenerative response is observed in all adult mammals, and so progression to heart failure can be very well modeled in the mouse. Interestingly, though, in mice, the response to myocardial infarction differs between developmental stages. So we now know that neonatal mice, uh, less than one week old, are capable of regenerating their heart with almost complete functional recovery after injury. However, this regenerative capacity is lost by postnatal day seven, after which time the default response is fibrosis and heart failure. So there's a great deal of optimism in the field currently based on the hope that we might learn from uh, model systems such as FISH and Eurodeals that retain their capacity to regenerate throughout life, or perhaps by identifying key changes that occur around the regenerative window between the neonatal to, uh, postnatal day one and post seven that may give some insight into how we could regenerate the heart in the in the adult mammal and ultimately humans. So what we know from these model organisms is that a holistic approach is required for cardiac regeneration. Of course, we need to give some consideration to how we might replace the, the lost cardiomyocytes uh, and f studies focus on perhaps stimulating proliferation of endogenous myocytes uh, by deriving them either from endogenous or exogenous stem cells or by reprogramming fibroblasts into cardiomyocytes by expression of the cardiogenic transcription factors identified from developmental studies. 
In general, the efficacy of these approaches is hampered first by the extent of cardiomyocyte replenishment that can be achieved, and secondly, by the immaturity of these cells. But the recent advances, for example, uh, identification of microRNAs that can induce resident cardiomyocytes to re-enter the cell cycle and, proje- and proliferate, gives us much optimism for some breakthroughs in this area. Uh, I mentioned the concern of immaturity of cardiomyocytes and the risk of arrhythmias. So it's clear that newly derived cardiomyocytes need to very rapidly acquire mature functionality to, in order to remuscularize the infarct without impairing the contractile rhythm of the existing heart muscle. Uh, the production of extracellular matrix and fibrosis, which we will hear more about in the, in the next presentation, uh, was historically considered a, a pathological mechanism uh, contributing to the excessive scarring. But we know that ECM deposition is essential to prevent early rupture and also to, um, we know from fish and neonatal mouse studies that it in fact facilitates um, near vascularization and remuscularization. So uh, it's not all bad. Um, likewise, the immune response needs to be very carefully balanced. Its activation is required early on to clear necrotic debris, to initiate in, uh, angiogenesis, and also to promote some degree of fibroblasting growth. However, the rapid resolution of inflammation is essential for regeneration. Similarly, rapid revascularization is absolutely essential for uh, for regeneration. This is the area that I will focus on uh, today for the remaining presentation. Um, We know that uh, rapid revascularization of the heart is essential for regeneration. As I've said, we know this from studies in, uh, in, in zebrafish, which have an innate ability to regenerate the heart. If you impair new vessel growth, for example, interfering with the, the VEGFA signaling pathway, uh, then you impair the natural ability of the fish to regenerate. Now, as we know, human patients who suffer myocardial infarction, infarction would ordinarily be rushed to hospital. They'd receive coronary intervention, um, and this would uh, attempt to reperfuse the vessels, the, the, the myocardium. However, up to 30% of patients uh, present the what's known as the no reflow phenomenon, which means that despite reopening the proximal artery, uh, incomplete perfusion of the microvascular bed results. So there remains in particular an urgent need to focus on the microvascular, regenerating the microvasculature. But unfortunately, attempts to do this in clinical trials have met with very modest success. So even administering the most potent growth factors that we know of, such as vascular endothelial growth factor A, uh, simply isn't enough. And this may be because we don't understand the mechanisms that intrinsically give rise to, or those that could be stimulated to give rise to new vessels. So I'd like to describe some, just some, I admit, of the recent studies in this area that might provide some important insights. So over decades now, there have been some descriptive studies. This is a a more recent one that just simply uses histological analysis to describe the dramatic expansion of capillaries into the infarct border zone. Um, This is accompanied by upregulation of endothelial genes and smooth muscle gene uh, gene expression. But where do these vessels come from and what drives their growth? It's very difficult from these types of studies to gain any understanding of the mechanisms involved. So one important study recently to address this came from Binjo's lab in Shanghai. They used three independent genetic lineage trace mouse lines to pre-label all the coronary endotheliols prior to myocardial infarction, they achieved a very efficient labeling. Almost 100% of the vessels were found to be labeled um, prior to infarction. And that proportion was unchanged after infarction. There was no dilution of cells from another source. And so the conclusion of this study is that all new vessels arise from pre-existing endothelial cells, probably via sprouting angiogenesis. Well, this would seem very likely, but um, a very recent study calls into question how such a mechanism may actually be regulated. So this study relied on the identification of enhancers of endothelial genes that are active during sprouting angiogenesis. So gene enhancers impose a very specific temporal and um, spatial control of gene expression. And some enhancers have been characterized that are selectively active uh, in angiogenic cells. 
These enhancers contain MEF2 uh, transcription factor binding sites and the upstream regulatory pathways leading to um, enhancer activation has been very well defined. Uh, and these path the, the, these, um, this pathway is highly conserved and has been shown to be restricted to sprouting angiogenic cells. The, the attraction of uh, identifying an enhancer, an enhancer approach, is that they can be connected to, uh, um, linked to reporters and transgenic animals derived that allow, uh, provide almost a real-time reporter of activity of an entire pathway. Um, and so such a reporter enhancer was utilized in a study to characterize the process of coronary vessel growth during development and the responses of the um, adult mouse following induced myocardial infarction. So the uh, activity was found to be highly active throughout, throughout um, embryonic coronary vessel development. Uh, it's known that this requires extensive angiogenesis. Um, but interestingly, this pathway was rema re remained highly active even in the adult heart, suggesting an even greater role for this pathway than, than imagined in homeostasis or maintenance of the coronary vasculature. So we would anticipate from this that this pathway might be highly induced in response to myocardial infarction. Surprisingly, the authors of this study found anything completely the opposite. Compared with the activity in the sham or uninjured adult heart, the uh, activity of this pathway was selectively uh, repressed or dampened in the infarct border zone following infarction. Um, this was incredibly intriguing. And then the authors focused then on the um, neonatal mouse model. Um, remember that the neonatal mouse can uh, entirely or almost entirely regenerate its heart. And uh, this is accompanied by an extensive uh, neoangiogenesis, probably an important part of this mechanism. This response was also in unexpected. We uh, sh should remember that the postnatal heart has a very high degree of angiogenesis. Uh, the, the, the heart is, is growing, expanding markedly during this period, and that requires substantial angiogenesis. So the pathway was shown uh, accordingly to be highly active. When uh, LAD ligation was performed in the neonatal mice, intriguingly, the pathway was strong, strongly active in the infarct border zone, but at the expense of the rest of the heart, the, the response of the angiogenic VEGFA pathway was actively suppressed throughout the rest of the heart. Uh, it may not be entirely clear why. <laughs> um, but what these studies tell us is that the pathway that's required for um, required for coronary expansion during development, the one that's shown to be required and essential for regeneration in the zebrafish, is selectively active in the remodeling regions of the neonatal heart, but for whatever reason is actively repressed in the remodeling regions of the adult mouse heart. So we assume that this may also be true in the human heart, and it may therefore explain why the clinical trial showed have minimal benefit. For whatever reason, the heart simply doesn't want to respond to the growth factor that is endogenously produced or that's given therapeutically. So going back to the previous lineage trace study, which proposed that all new vessels derive uh, via sprouting angiogenesis, um, we'd have to assume that this, this is by a non-VEGFA mediated pathway, um, which would be entirely unexpected given that that's the normal uh, response of the adult um, of the adult tissues downstream of hypoxia or might there be another mechanism uh, involved a number of studies have attempted to to, to investigate this um, and I'll give just one example so this is a study that performed a similar lineage tracing study as to the one that I just described but this used, it used an alternative endothelial CRE uh, reporter. And in this line, although all capillaries, arterial, um, arteries and veins were labeled, the only lineage that wasn't labeled with this approach, intriguingly, was the endocardium. So shown here or more clearly perhaps here. Um, and then when myocardial infarction was induced, and the infarct border zone area investigated, 
in contrast to the previous study showing 100% label, labeling. Almost 30% of vessels in this infarct border zone, in these infarct border zones, were found uh, not to be labeled. Um, so particularly the vessels found to grow into the region, these elongated ones, and notably large vessels under the uh, underlying the endocardium. So um, the interpretation of these studies is that these are endothelial cells that were not expressing endothelial markers before MI. And therefore, they derive perhaps from a progenitor source or from an unlabeled endothelial source. And the most likely in this context of the heart would be the endocardium. So the reasons for focusing on the endocardium are twofold. One is that the, the endocardium is one of the two main sources of coronary vessels in the developing heart. It contributes vessels to the, to the ventral aspect, the inner myocardial walls, and the interventricular septum. Um, and the endocardium is indeed the primary contributor during postnatal stages. Uh, but this is via a non-sprouting mechanism, intriguingly. So the embryonic heart is characterized by being highly trabeculated, a number of finger-like protrusions. But over the course of development, uh, these trabeculae compact to increase muscle mass in the ventricular walls. But also what was proposed by um, the group of Binjo was... Um, that in doing so, the endocardial lining of the, of the ventricle uh, becomes trapped within the myocardium, and these uh, the, the endocardial cells rapid, uh, differentiate into a coronary endothelial type um, and rapidly coalesce to form new vessels. So the second reason for the perhaps a link with the endocardium is that a very intriguing remodeling of the endocardium has been reported following infarction. Uh, again, so the, the formation in the adult after injury of some sort of finger-like protrusions and uh, and um, and lumina appearing below the endocardium, uh, such as shown here, and over, over time these undergo further remodeling uh, with a compaction a compaction type mechanism. And this coincides with the appearance of new vessels that express coronary vascular markers below the endocardial surface. So tracking back through uh, the, the earlier stages, we see the finger-like protrusions forming, the lumina. Um, these appear to come together, perhaps fuse, and then the emergence of, of, uh, of vessel-like structures. Uh, the um, mesenchymal-type cells emerge below the at the endocardium, and these mature over time, appear to mature with time to uh, form uh, mature smooth muscle type markers, and the appearance of large uh, vessels below the endocardium that are not ordinarily seen on this on uh, in this region of the heart. The the larger arteries and veins are always observed uh, in the healthy heart on the on the more epicardial side. So these were shown to increase over time and perhaps therefore suggestive, but without definitive proof that they may arise from the, from the endocardium. Um, so that's just one study to illustrate some possible sprouting mechanisms that may contribute, but clearly further work is required in this area. There, in terms of classic angiogenic mechanisms, there are a few very exciting recent studies that have been published that use multicolor lineage tracing and single cell transcri transcriptomic analysis to assess the heterogeneity of coronary endothelial cells. And what these studies showed is that there are discrete populations of endothelial cells within the heart, and they vary enormously in their potential for angiogenesis post MI. Um, importantly, these by this, this type of analysis revealed novel targets that may be more efficient in stimulating angiogenesis by activating the relevant population of endothelial cells rather than non-selectively hitting all cells with the wrong growth factors. So as a final point, when we're thinking of neovascularization, we should of course not uh, forget collateral growth. The reason we didn't focus heavily on this is because th th this is uh, in general a more widely researched area. Uh, it's an important mechanism for functional bypassing occluded arteries, 
Uh, we know that human patients often have a very well-developed network of collateral arteries, and this perhaps limits their risk of myocardial infarction. Um, but recent studies in uh, the neonatal mouse in particular have given some insights into the mechanism by which collateral vessels form. And this particular study from Christy Redhorse's lab identified the chemokine CXCL12 as a factor that can promote collateral artery growth rapidly in adult mice following LAD ligation. So this is a very exciting uh, study that potentially has very important therapeutic uh, relevance. So I've hoped, I hope I've managed to convey just a snapshot of what we can learn about regeneration from some of the newer models, the zebrafish and the neonatal mouse. Um, and also some insights into revascularization mechanisms that may be targeted as part of a therapy in future. So if we return to our multiple choice question, uh, I'll remind you, the question is what are the main mechanisms that enable new blood vessel growth in the ischemic heart? There were a number of options, vascular genesis, angiogenesis, arterial, arteriogenesis, or a combination of those. Uh, and maybe now I could ask Dr. Schmitz if we've had any um, any answers from participants and what they thought. Okay, so yes, we have. Um, I can see that we have about 4% of the people choosing vascular genesis, oh. 11 angiogenesis, uh, 11 on arteriogenesis, and we have 39% of the people going for answer D, so okay. combination of D, 34 for A, B, and C. So I think... People realize it's a combination of factors. It's just a question which combination. Right. Well, I would say they're absolutely right. I mean, we can't be equivocal about this because, of course, there are different studies that have uh, that suggest different mechanisms or a combination of mechanisms. We know for sure that there's collateral growth, and we know that there's definitely an angiogenic role. Uh, the question is whether that whether that arises from a sub a subpopulation of endothelial cells in particular, and if the mechanisms are perhaps different from the assumed VEGFA-induced sprouting angiogenesis. We can't rule out uh, vascular genesis, but the evidence for that is not very strong anymore. The, the endothelial lineage trace studies suggest that there's little contribution from non-endothelial um, non sources. So I would say the answer is D, uh, strong support for angiogenesis and arteriogenesis, but we can't fully exclude the possibility that there may be some vascular genesis. So potentially E, um, but I would say D. So just to finish there, um, I'd, very, I'd, I'd summarize by saying that rapid revascularization is known, for example, from the zebrafish to be absolutely essential for regeneration of the infected heart and should be considered in any therapeutic strategies um, in future. There are intrinsic responses of the heart to ischemia. These are presumably an attempt to restore perfusion, but they're probably not as efficient as they should be. And perhaps by understanding the mechanisms, and the possible sources, we may be able to um, enhance the efficiency of those. So I've mentioned a number of sources, um, the pre-existing coronary vessels, perhaps the endocardium, definitely collateral growth, and there may be some as yet identified sources. So I'll stop there um, and we could move on to the next presentation. Yes, I prefer thank you very much for a, a clear overview. Um, we will answer questions at the end of uh, both presentation. So we'll now continue with the presentation by Professor Diaz on targeting myocardial fibrosis. So go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, express my appreciation to the working group to invite me to this uh, webinar. I will move the focus from the infarcted heart to the pressure overload heart. And I will begin by uh, presenting you a clinical case. It's a 58-year-old man presenting with exceptional dyspnea that was referred by his general practitioner to a echocardiography due to suspicion of heart failure. The ECG showed a sinus ring with a left band of branch block. Ten years earlier, the patient was diagnosed with having essential hypertension with a blood pressure level of 170 over 100 millimeters of mercury. 
the echocardiographic examination showed normal ventricular ejection fraction, normal ventricular mass index at that time. The patient stated to receive an antihypertensive treatment consisting of remipril with uh, 2.5 milligrams to ice, which reduced the blood pressure to 155 over 90 millimeters of mercury. At the time of referral due to heart failure symptoms, the patient had not received any antihypertensive treatment for the last three years. In addition to this uh, medical history, he also presented serum cholesterol levels in uh, with treatment with atorvastatin, and then atorvastatin was prescribed. Uh, at the first visit to the heart failure clinic, he was presented with exceptional dyspnea, crawling to near heart association class two, fatigue and dizziness. He had no heart apnea or angina pectoris, no peripheral edema, no jugular vein congestion. His blood pressure was 162 over 105 millimeters of mercury, and pulse was 64 bits per minute. Serum creatinine was 2.2 milligrams per deciliter, and the estimated glomerular filtration rate was of 47 ml per minute per 1.73 square meters. There was no trace of protein in the urine sample. At that time, echocardiography showed normal ventricular ejection fraction, 55%. Concentric LVH or ventricular hypertrophy as characterized by a ventricular mass index of 140 grams per square meter and a relative wall thickness of 0 0.50. Diastolic dysfunction characterized by an increased EE prime ratio of 20 and M is prime septal and lateral wall uh, velocity of 6 centimeters per second. And also an increased volume, the atrial volume characterized by a left atrial dilatation of 45 ml per square meter. At that time, the plasma level of NT protein P was increased, 345 picograms per ml. And the serum cholesterol persisted increased despite treatment with atorvastatin. Uh, for detection of a possible uh, renal artery stenosis, an ultrasound of renal arteries was performed that was negative. In order to exclude coronary artery disease, coronary CT and geography was in performed in the aorta, and the coronary CTA scan showed a single small nonostructive calcified peak in the left anterior descending artery. Otherwise, no sign of perturbation of the aorta of all abnormalities was found. Uh, taking advantage of this angiographic examination, transvenous endomyocardial biosis were taken from the middle area of the interventricular septum under foroscoping guidance after coronary examination. And what we observed is a diffuse interstitial deposition of number one, red stained fibers accompanied by number two, microscopic scarring, and number three, prevascular fibrosis. The calculated myocardial collagen volume fraction of this uh, slide was of 10%. Thus, according to our previous classification of myocardial fibrosis in hypertensive heart disease, in which the threshold value for this parameter, myocardial collagen volume fraction, was established in 6%, this patient was classified as presenting with severe fibrosis. Thus, this patient is a classical patient with long-standing uncontrolled hypertension that develops a new uh, a new uh, clinical picture of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. We attributed this uh, level of uh, heart failure to hypertensive heart disease, in which we also were able to identify severe myocardial fibrosis. Additionally, the patient exhibited other comorbidities, such as, for instance, stage 3A chronic kidney disease, probably, probably due to nephroangiosclerosis. Taking into account this clinical case, I propose the following four questions. In patients with FF, myocardial volume, colony volume fraction is associated with the following echocardiographic parameters. Left ventricular mass index is response A. The EE prime ratio is response B. Left atrial volume is response C. Our left ventricular ejection fraction is response D. The second question. In patients with HFF, myocardial collagen volume fraction is associated with the following outcome. Hospitalization for heart failure is response A. Cardiovascular death is response B. All cause is response C. And all the above 
hospitalization, cardiovascular death, and all cause death is response D. The third question, which of the following circulating biomarkers is associated with the myocardial colon volume fraction in patients with HFPF? Response A, galactin-3. Response B, the c terminal propeptide of fruit colon type 1. Response C, soluble ST2. And response D, the tissue inhibitor of matrix metal protein is 1. And finally, question number four. Which of the following drugs reduces the myocardial colon volume fraction in patients with head path? Response A, terazomide. Response B, espinolactam. Response C, either terazomide or espinolactam. And response D, none of the above drugs. Let me move to the presentation in order to provide responses to this question at the end of my talk. From my point of view, the, an overview of cardiac, of cardiac regenerative medicine tools and goals should include at this time that we are living the reversal of the extracellular matrix alterations present within the cardiac parenchyma, within the myocardium. The different tools should be focused not only on re regenerate cardiomyocytes and restore the microcirculation as previously uh, said by our colleague, but also to reverse extracellular matrix alterations. In this setting, the fibroblasts have the potential not only to regenerate cardiomyocytes by reforming, not only to promote angiogenesis by mechanisms I still unknown, but also the cardiac fibroblasts can be used as a target cell to reverse extracellular matrix alterations. In this setting, what we propose is that by modulating the, phenot the fibroblast phenotype, we can reach the goal to reverse extracellular matrix alterations present in some cardiac diseases. Let me focus my attention on the fibroblast phenotype. We distinguish two different types of fibroblasts involved in alterations of the extracellular matrix. Those phenotype, those cardiac uh, fibroblasts that are activated and in, are characterized by a prosynthetic uh, secretome of matrix molecules, and those activated fibroblasts that are characterized by the opposite, the synthesis and secretion of a matrix regarding uh, secretome. The origin of these two different, of, the, of these two types of phenotypically uh, different activated fibroblasts is the same. In conditions of mechanical stress or even non-mechanical stress, through mechanosensitive signaling cascades and through neuronal activation, some signaling pathways are activated, namely the TGF beta small CTGF fibroid that is responsible for the activation and transferization of a number of cardiac cells and non cardiac cells, mostly resident Kessin fibroblasts, to activated fibroblasts that will transferentiate in myofibroblasts. But let me repeat again. We now know that there are two different phenotypes in terms of secretome of these myofibrolas. Those facilitating the synthesis of collagen of matrix and those promoting the degradation of collagen matrix. The first of these two phenotypes is the one involved in the accumulation of collagen matrix leading to the diastrophic fibrosis, whereas the other phenotype is responsible for the degradation of collagen matrix and extracellular matrix in general, leading to adverse myocardial remodeling. Uh, this approach means that we need to understand that fibrosis is, at the end, a problem of abnormal altered equilibrium between the synthesis and the degradation of extracellular matrix, in particular of fibrillar collagens. And this means that we need to go to the end of the process, which is the number of events occurring at the extracellular level leading to the deposition and removal of collagen fibers. In this setting, I am showing here 
the different steps involved in the cellular synthesis, for instance, of collagen type 1 fibers. The precursor for collagen type 1, which is released by to the cellular matrix by the activated fibroblast, is converted in the mightier collagen type 1 molecule due to the action of a number of enzymes that are able to clip the, excuse me, that are able to uh, clip the amino and the carboxy terminal peptide. These mature collagen type 1 molecules in a terminal terminal self-assembly self -assembly process lead to the collagen type 1 microfibril. And these collagen type 1 microfibrils in a later lateral cell assembly process lead to the collagen type 1 fibrin. The cross-linking of collagen type 1 fibrils which is mediated by a number of byproducts, including enzymes such as the family of lysyl oxidase enzymes, is responsible for the formation of the of the final collagen type 1 fiber. So, when I talked before of of fibroblasts with the matrix synthesizing phenotype, I was talking about fibroblasts which secrete to the extracellular space more products, more molecules involved in the synthesis and the position of collagen type 1 fibers that the opposite the degradation of collagen type 1 fibers. Here I am showing you the second part, the degradation of the collagen fiber. When the collagen fiber has accomplished the, his uh, life, a number of molecules will be involved in the degradation and removal of this fiber, including matrix metalloproteinases and other molecules. Importantly, when the, when the fibroblast belongs to the secretome, to the phenotype of the matrix degrading secretome, is the fibroblast which releases to the stressor space more of these molecules involved in the degradation of collagen type 1 fibers than the other ones involved in the collagen type 1 synthesis. So in a simplistic way, what we need is to approach the treatment of extracellular matrix alterations present in a number of cardiac conditions by looking at what we are looking for to reduce fibrosis or to reduce adverse remodeling. And this means to reduce the excessive synthesis of collagen molecules over degradation or to reduce the excessive degradation of collagen molecules over their synthesis. And this means that we know, we need to know which one of the two phenotypes of cardiac fibroblasts is predominating in these different conditions. You can assume that in those conditions characterized by an excess of collagen fiber of collagen tissue, the matrix synthesizing secretome uh, fibroblast phenotype is predominating, whereas in the other conditions characterized by reduced collagen matrix leading to adverse remodeling, what is predominating is the fibroblast with a matrix degrading secretome phenotype. So, by assuming this approach, we can now consider the different possibilities that we have to target this, this carrier fibroblast. We can target fibroblast by modifying its secretome acting from inside the cell or acting from outside the cell at the cellular space level. In fact, by acting within the cell, we can modify the biosynthetic activity of the fibroblasts of those molecules leading to excessive synthesis or excessive degradation. And um, we can do also the same thing by acting definitively, finally, on those molecules already secreted by the fibroblasts to the extracellular space that facilitate either synthesis or degradation. In one case, the goal should be to reduce synthesis and facilitate the coupling of synthesis with degradation to remove the excessive fibrotic tissue accumulated within the myocardium. And on the other side, the other goal will be to reduce the degradation, which is leading to a reduction in collagen, scalfall, and matrix in order to facilitate the coupling between the normal synthesis and the normal degradation, and then to prevent, to prevent adverse remodeling. Our group was involved mostly in uh, targeting diffuse fibrosis. Why? Because remembering the clinical case that I have presented you before, we are now aware there are now clinical evidence, 
clinical evidence, I repeat, demonstrating that myocardial fibrosis by altering the physical properties of the myocardium, altering the cellular interactions and tissue architecture of the myocardium, and also leading to impairment of the stressor matrix as a global chemical reservoir, leads to alterations in both diastolic and systolic function and alterations in the electrical activity of the left ventricle and either the left atria that are involved, that are associated with impaired clinical outcomes in heart failure patients. So we need now to include myocardial fibrosis in the equation of actions to promote the repair of the myocardium. But this means another important aspect. In the 21st century, we cannot speak more about myocardial fibrosis without characterizing the histomolecular components of this lesion. And the histomolecular components of these lesions are related to those characteristics of myocardial fibrosis that are involved in the main pathophysiological alteration of the fibrotic heart which is the increase in left ventricular stiffness leading to alterations in left ventricular field and diastolic dysfunction and failure. And these two molecular components are on one hand, the chemical composition, the, the quality of the collagen fibers. Please remember that collagen type one fibers are stiffer than collagen type three fibers. And in the fibrotic myocardium, the relation between collagen type 1 and collagen type 3 will determine finally left ventricular stiffness. And second, take also into account that the degree of cross-linking among collagen fibers constituting the final collagen fiber is also responsible for the stiffness of the fiber in the sense that the higher is the cross-link, the higher are the number of covalent bonds uh, aimed on collagen fibers, the higher will be the stiffness of the final collagen fiber. So what we need either acting from inside the fibroblasts or acting on the secreted products to the cellular space is to act on these two key parameters, those responsible for the synthesis and accumulation of collagen type 1 and those responsible for the accumulation, the cross-linking of collagen fibers. In other words, we can simplify this histomolecular approach to treat myocardial fibrosis by saying that we need to modulate the pro fibrotic prosynthesizing final type of cardiac fibroblasts acting from inside the cell to avoid the excessive extracellular formation of collagen type 1 and the extracellular cross-linking of collagen type 1. And we can do that. We have identified recently some properties taken into account these three uh, pathways. For instance, taken into account non-coding RNAs. As you are aware, probably, there is a cluster of microRNAs, the cluster 1792, which has been linked to organ fibrosis. For instance, the microRNA19 has been linked to the cardiac fibrosis. And in our hands, this is true. In fact, we have seen in heart failure patients that there is a reduced expression of this microRNA19B, and this reduced expression is associated with increased expression of the enzyme responsible for collagen cross-linking, and in fact, is, responsible, is also associated inversely with increased collagen cross-linking. The lower is the expression of this microRNA in the failing human myocardium in patients with hypertensive heart disease, the higher is the cross-linking of the deposited collagen fibers. And this is confirmed at in vitro level studies because in isolated human cardiac fibroblasts, we were able to demonstrate that by using anti microRNA 19B, uh, there is an excess in the expression of the line seal oxidase enzyme responsible for coin, which is not accompanied by changes in the corresponding microRNA. But as I said before, we can use these genetic molecular intercellular approaches to modify the phenotype of the profibrotic fibroblast, but we can also act on the final byproducts secreted by these profibrotic fibroblasts to the extracellular space. And to do that, we can use biologicals or either even, excuse me, chemical agents, pharmacological agents already existing in uh, the clinical practice. Let me show you some small pieces of evidence that in fact fibrosis can be reversed by using pharmacological agents that we can use now to treat cardiac patients. The combination of the loop diuretic trovazamide 
plus the angiotensin receptor blocker was happened, is able to modulate the prophybrotic cardiac fibrosis phenotype in heart failure patients and to reduce myocardial fibrosis. How do this combination modify the phenotype? By reducing the expression at the cardiac level of the, one of the enzymes responsible for the conversion of collagen type 1 precursor in collagen type 1 molecule. And second, by reducing also the expression at the myocardial level of the enzyme lacid oxidase responsible for collagen cross-linking. These two molecular actions are accompanied by, first, the reduction in the deposition of collagen type 1 and the reduction in the degree of collagen cross-linking of the deposited collagen molecules. And this translates to the clinical level in a reduction in level stiffness constant and a reduction in the circulating level of nt vmp Importantly, none of these molecular, histomolecular, and clinical effects is observed in patients treated with furosemide instead of torazemide or other ARBs instead of losartan, telling us that this combination is specific for this modulation of cardiac fibroblast phenotype and antifibrotic effect. And this can be explained because toracemide, in difference to furosemide, also possess this part of the molecule, the cyanidin, which characterizes the synthetic inhibitors of the enzyme PSCP procolian C proteinase that converts procolian into collagen. And second, the losartan ARB is the only one ARB that possesses this particular metabolite, the metabolite 3179, which is not the one which blocks the 81 receptor. This is the metabolite 3174. And this metabolite, which is specific for losartan, as you can see here, is able to reduce the expression, to stimulate, excuse me, the expression of, to reduce the expression of lysid oxidase mRNA in rats exhibiting myocardial fibrosis. So, thoracemide, due to the thin component, ligand component of its chemical structure, and losartan, due to the presence of this metabolite, which is specific for him, for it, not for other ARBs, is the combination that by modifying the phenotype of the cardiac fibroblast is able to reduce not only the amount of collagen type 1 fibers, but also the degree of collagen cross-linking of these molecules. And at the end, by, is able to ameliorate level ventricular stiffness and level ventricular stress. So what I would like to propose is that myocardial fibrosis can be a target in cardiovascular regenerative and reparative medicine, but that we need to approach this target in a double way with a dual approach. In fact, it's not the same to act on the microscopic focal scar that appears in the infarcted heart. In this degree, the inhibition of the fibrogenic activity of the fibroblast and the stimulation of its regenerative potential should be the goal to remove fibrotic tissue and regenerate cardiomyocytes, whereas all the non-infarcted conditions, as the one presented here, for instance, pressure overload due to hypertensive heart disease, what we need is to target microscopic diffuse interstitial fibrosis. And this means that we need to inhibit the fibrogenic activity of the fibroblast, modulating its phenotype, and at the end, reducing its secretome ability to facilitate the accumulation of fibrotic tissue. Then, after this presentation, I'll go back to the question in order to see how these questions could be answered. Maybe, Professor Smith, you have some preliminary responses? Yes, I have. Um, so, uh, regarding question one, um, if you look at the echocardiographic parameters, most of the people voted for answer B, the E, e prime ratio. That's correct. We are in the That's same. Okay, good. <laughs> um, for question two, uh, the uh, outcome after uh, when looking at the collagen volume fraction, um, most of the audience voted for answer D. That's perfect. That's correct. It has been demonstrated, in fact, that myocardial fibrosis is the, the quantity 
the severity of myocardial fibrosis is associated with the three outcomes uh, mentioned in response of A, B, and C. Yes, perfect. Okay, so uh, regarding question three, what I got from our previous poll is that um, uh, people were a bit divided. So um, we have a tie between answer B and answer D. So could you elaborate on which one is the correct one? Yes. Uh, from these four potential markers of myocardial fibrosis, the only one in which it has been demonstrated that the circulating level is related to the amount of deposited choline type 1 at the myocardial level in health testing is the one presented in response B. The C-terminal peptide of choline type 1 is the a small C-terminal peptide which is released by procholine protein A that I mentioned before when procholine type 1 is converted in choline type 1. Whereas the tissue inhibitor of matrix metalloproteinase 1 never has been demonstrated to be associated, to be correlated with the amount of choline deposition with the amount of myocardial fibrosis. So here the response is clear. Only B is true. Okay. Um, and then regarding question four. So um, I have the poll at the start of the presentation as well as the answer that most people gave just a minute ago. So initially most, uh, there was a tie between answer B and D. Well, after the presentation, we see that most people answered A. So and that, I think you should uh, give us the correct answer in this case. Yes. Uh, Espinolactam has been demonstrated to reduce myocardial fibrosis, to reduce choline volume fraction many years ago by a Japanese group in patients with heart failure and reduce the ejection fraction. Whereas in patients with heart failure and preserved ejection fraction, the only one of these two uh, pharmacological agents that has been demonstrated to reduce myocardial fibrosis is terazimide. Mm -hmm. So the correct response for HEFPEF is terazimide, whereas for HEFREF should be a spinolactone. So, yeah, so it's very clear that for the different types of uh, fibrosis, um, absolutely a different approach to treat patients. Absolutely. We need to to, uh, to approach the treat the targeting and um, treatment of fibrosis using very precise uh, uh, considerations. Okay, uh, so I have finished my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I am looking at the questions that have been asked online. Uh, there are questions for both of you. So uh, I will start with uh, a question for Dr. Smart, if that's okay. Yes. Um, someone asked, when and at what exact time after am I in neonatal uh, mice, uh, does VEGF signaling and angiogenesis occur? Is this a matter of minutes or is this hours? And um, a question related to that, is there any specified or expected time for the collateral arteries to form in the adult human heart? So these are questions relating to timeline. Do you have any insights into this? Uh, ooh, some insights, but probably not a very precise answer. And I think the reason is that, I, as to my knowledge, nobody's looked within minutes of injury in the neonatal mouse heart. I may have overlooked some studies, but most studies first look uh, within a matter of days. Perhaps even, I, I would anticipate that the um, angiogenic response might initiate within the first hour or two. Um but nobody's really looked before 24 hours. Um, it's certainly active by then um, and is very clear after two days, seven days, and so on. In Well, in human patients, collaterals develop very gradually. Um, and it's really hard to, again, if you unless you're tracking progression in the same patient over a longitudinal time course, it's very difficult to show that precise timeline um, because they arise so gradually. I, I, I suppose we have mm -hmm. to look more at then the murine studies and again in the neonatal heart where the collaterals develop uh, endogenously in response to MI, they form over weeks um, and they can be induced to form over a week or two in the adult heart only if given CXCL12. 
So I'm not sure that completely answers the question. I, I think, unfortunately, the, the data for adult studies is just not known in precise detail. Okay, yeah, much remains unclear and then uh, at this moment, of course. Um, looking into the questions, um, Professor Diaz, uh, when you consider repair after more acute damage like myocardial infarction, do you think that targeting extracellular matrix components can be a sufficient therapeutic strategy to induce repair by taking away the scar, or do we need more to really repair uh, or regenerate a heart? Okay, uh, the question is that there are three different types of alterations at the extracellular matrix level in the infarcted heart. First, the infarcted region itself, which is uh, which results in a scar, the very infarcted region, and the diffuse, the distant the, the region. What I have presented today is how approach, how target myocardial fibrosis, diffuse myocardial fibrosis, which is present. In the non infarcted heart, uh, for instance, the pressure of a lot heart, but that is also present in, the, in, in, to, in contrast to the myocardial uh, problem, to the alterations of the stressor matrix which are present in the infarcted heart. As you know, the natural evolution of the infarcted heart is to become dilated and dilated. This means that there is a loss of collagen scaffold of extracellular matrix. This means that in this case, what is predominant is the fibroblasts with the degrading secretome phenotype. Mm -hmm. So what I think is that we need to approach the question of the extracellular matrix in a very different way depending on what we are considering. Dilated cardiomyopathy, ischemic cardiomyopathy with a tendency to destroy extracellular matrix destroy collagen scaffold, yeah. then we need to proceed in a very opposite way that I have recommended today for the other diseases in which the predominance is of accumulation of fibrotic tissue due to the phenotype of collagen synthesizing. So I know that this can be complicated, but this means that considering extracellular matrix we can and the fibroblasts, we can consider two sides of the, uh, of the mirror. Accumulation of fibrotic tissue, fibroblasts, the profibrotic fibroblasts, the synthesizing secretome. And this is true in hypertensive heart disease, diuretic cardiomyopathy, and so on. Whereas in diuretic cardiomyopathy, ischemic heart disease, post inflation, which is true is the opposite destruction and loss of collagen, scaffold, and stressor matrix, the phenotype. Cardiac fibroblasts with the antifibrotic, the anti matrix the, of uh, phenotype in which the secretome is a degrading secretome. In these cases, what I should expect is that by controlling matrix metalloproteases and metric kinds uh, activity, we mm. can protect the heart. Yeah. Okay, very clear. Thank you very much. Um, due to time, we were unable to answer all the questions, so I'm going to um, uh, ask one short question to uh, Dr. Smart, if possible, before we wrap up. When talking about extracellular matrix, uh, for, for instance, after acute damage, it's, it doesn't only have a detrimental role. How important is the extracellular matrix for inducing neovascularization? For in Do you think it's necessary? Uh, well, we know it's necessary in species, for example, the zebrafish that can regenerate. Uh, so um, a study from Ken Poss's lab showed that fibronectin deposition actually by the epicardium is essential for neovascularization. And if you impair that, you impair not only neovascularization, but also cardiomyocyte proliferation. Um, and then there's some exciting, albeit very preliminary, data now emerging from um, the group of Karen Kreisman in um in California. They've okay. recently published a study, it's a phase one clinical trial, um, and admittedly this wasn't even powered to assess efficacy, but it shows some very exciting results. They uh, used an injectable hydrogel um, in, in patients 
uh, patients with heart failure after myocardial infarction. Um, and this hydrogel was derived from porcine cardiac extracellular matrix. And as well as improving cardiac function, it uh, was shown to improve uh, vascularization, not just in the heart, but also in other uh, injured tissues. So I, I think it... It's hard to, to make a leap from zebrafish to man, but it's likely that some of these mechanisms will will be fundamentally important in all species. Um, so yes, yeah. the matrix is absolutely important as our paracrine factors. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we are now approaching the end of this webinar, and I would like to close this session by summarizing the key messages. Uh, both neovascularization and fibrosis are key components in cardiac disease and interfering with these processes will provide therapeutic options to repair the heart after damage. I would like to remind you that you can register for part two of this webinar, which will be live on October 1st. I, I would like to remind you that you be, can become a member of the Working Group on Cardiovascular Regenerative and Reparative Medicine through the ESC website. And for early career scientists, please check out the Scientist of Tomorrow LinkedIn webpage to stay updated. And finally, I would like to thank Dr. Smart and Professor Diaz for their excellent presentations and uh, to thank you uh, all for your active contribution. You will be able to watch this webinar on demand on the ESC website. Thank you and have a good evening.